I'm going to talk first a little bit about the, the physics, why this is an interesting problem. Um, basically, we've been working on this for years and years, trying to figure out what happens to hydrogen at uh, under extreme conditions. Not too extreme, but I'll explain it before. Uh, you can look in the abstract, find uh, references to this. But I want to emphasize that these calculations recently have been done by Carlo Pierleoni, my collaborator in Italy. And so if you're going to ask detailed things, I'm going to have to ask him. <laughs> um, uh, why study dense hydrogen? Well, there's kind of three big reasons. Um, first is sort of a, uh, a pra somewhat practical or connections to things outside of physics. First to astrophysics, you know, it's the most common uh, material in the universe, uh, dense hydrogen. And um, the, like, it, in our solar system, we have Jupiter and Saturn made of hydrogen and helium, but plus a few other things. Um, there's going to be a flurry of interest in a couple of weeks when the Juno spacecraft reaches uh, Jupiter. Um, in the last uh, decade, maybe 10,000 new planets like Jupiter and Saturn have been observed around other stars. And so it's, it's if you're going to understand all those things, you've got to understand hydrogen. Um, the other reason, uh, partly responsible for us funding, is the there's a big facility at Livermore doing inertially confined fusion where they compress hydrogen to high pressures. And, you know, again, uh, you want to understand how hydrogen behaves. Um, but, of course, we're more interested in fundamental physics, namely hydrogen is the first element. We should understand it. And it's not so simple. Hydrogen is not necessary, even though it only has one electron and one proton in an atom, um, when you have many body, that is when you have a bulk, system, it's as complicated as any other material. Um, and I'll ex talk to the, about that in a second. But the third reason is that it's really a benchmark for simulation. It doesn't have some of the complications of other materials. It doesn't have core electrons. We model it directly from the fundamental interactions between electrons and protons and you know between charged particles. It just makes it a little bit simpler, eliminates one of the problems we have in simulating materials, but it has other problems that other materials don't have, namely the pro both the protons and electrons are strongly quantum systems. And other materials, you kind of say the nuclei are, are classical objects, but with hydrogen you can't get away with that. Uh, here is an astrophysical size uh, phase diagram, and I, of course in this short talk I can't talk too much about it. But, you know, basically in the laboratory or down here, uh, you know, liquid hydrogen and gaseous hydrogen over here, and then and, and you go up in pressure. These are the questions about the phase diagram. There's a lot of interesting questions, but we're only going to focus on the first one. Is there a liquid-liquid transition in dense hydrogen? Uh, I'll come back to that later in the talk. I mean, there's a lot of other interesting questions that we're also exploring on blue waters, but, you know, I'm going to just focus on one of them. Where made a lot of uh, progress recently. How would you explore the properties of hydrogen in, in the re regime where the planets are, the interior of Jupiter or Saturn? Well, the first thing that people have done is shockwave experiments, where there's a lot of ways you can do shockwave, but basically you take a sample of hydrogen, uh, probably at low temperature, and then you hit it with something, a laser beam, a uh, magnetic implosion, a bullet, whatever, and then you generate a shock wave and then you shine x-rays and find out the velocity of the shock wave. The, the thing at, at Livermore is this uh, NIF, this billion dollar uh, apparatus is really quite amazing. You know, this is a building, you can't even see the person here, but you know, this is like 250 lasers pointed at this little dot here. In, in a nanosecond, right? And it generates a shock, and you do the experiment. You can imagine how expensive that is. Uh, and the other approach, which was invented in the 60s, is so-called diamond anvil cell, and this is a, uh, you know, miniaturization is great. Okay, so you take two diamonds, and you use the idea of pressure as force over area, so uh, you make a very small area, and you generate a very high pressure, just like uh, the pressure underneath a high heel shoe can be very high because the 
area is small, right? Um, and so there's your sample right here, and then you can shine lasers in there and do it. Well, the trouble is that diamonds break eventually, um, uh, and you can only get up to three million atmospheres before they break, and unfortunately, hydrogen uh, tends to cause them to break easier. It catalyzes the, the cracks. And also, diamonds burn, right? It's not the most stable form of carbon. And also, when you get up above room temperature, they tend to break easily or eventually collapse. So here is actually this phase diagram again that's showing uh, this is the experimental region of diamond anvil cells, which is, you know, the preferred technique. But eventually, you know, you can't go up to high temperatures or high, high pressures. And this is where Jupiter and Saturn sit way up here. And this is what you, if you shock something, you go up this curve here. So, you know, there's a lot of physics here that is not accessible to experiment or to very expensive experiment. So we try to, we want to do ab initio things, right? So quantum Monte Carlo is our technique. Basically, why? Well, it's just that, um, you know, our premise is that we have to do simulations where we represent electrons and protons as point particles um, uh, to solve the quantum anybody problem, just like you do classically, just like when you do classical water or uh, some other, you know, a protein or whatever. Uh, there's no reason why you could get away with uh, mean field descriptions for electronic structure any more than you can for, say, a simulation of a protein. Um, so it's basically based on Feynman's path integral, imaginary time path integral. There's a variety of these stochastic or quantum Monte Carlo methods that we use and what I'm going to describe. And so I don't have really a chance to go through them. Some of the other talks uh, yesterday did describe them a little bit. Um, so there, these are the, uh, the techniques. I mean, uh, the, what was described yesterday, diffusion Monte Carlo is a zero temperature technique. That doesn't get us up here where the planetary interiors are. Path integral, pure path integral techniques started uh, at sort of a million degrees and work down, and it's hard for them to get into this region. So we use something we called coupled electron I in Monte Carlo, where we basically have the electrons at zero temperature and the ions at a non-zero temperature, and we have two coupled Monte Carlo processes that, um, that connect the two. And um, you know, we you know, this is the reptation is the um, electron dynamics, and the path integral method is for the proton dynamics, how they move around, and we have a, an exact way of coupling them, that is a, a way, a controlled method um, that doesn't introduce more approximations. So we can do on the order of 100 electrons and 100 protons, we just put them in a box, and we use the trial wave function to, uh, for the electrons to kind of, uh, to guide the random walk in the region that's important. Um, in the last 10 years or 15 years, there have been development of new techniques, which has really made this possible. I'm going to t talk a little bit about finite size scaling methods, because that's related to a parallel computation. We have better trial wave functions. Um, and of course, one of the big changes in the last 15 years is things that were, we could just do on a trial basis when we started doing this in the, uh, f 10 years ago, we now have a thousand times more computer resources, and we can really do the calculation, whereas before we could just nibble at the calculation. And so a lot of the older results were not really converged, but now we can kind of converge the approximations and you know, get what we think are really um, realistic uh, case. So I was going to describe very briefly what are the differences between quantum and classical simulations is you have the phase of the wave function can become a variable. You, w you work in a periodic box, and you know as an electron goes out one side and comes back into the other side, it can pick up a phase. And by averaging over this phase, you can make your small system of 100 atoms behave like an infinite system. Basically, and this graph shows you that you get like two orders of magnitude improvement in the and the finite size effects. Um, now, why is this important for parallel computation? Well, basically, we set up a four-dimensional lattice that consists of the twisted boundary conditions, that is, in x, y, and z direction. That's what this cube shows. 
And we, in the fourth direction, is imaginary time for the protons. And so they, they have, um, you know, the protons are described by a path integral. So each one of these things is an independent calculation. Uh, that is, the electrons, you know, um, uh, we solve the electronic structure problem for each one of these lattice points. And that may be on the order of a thousand um, lattice points. And, the, and then the result comes back and we calculate the energy and the variance from the electronic structure part. And it turns out that this is almost free. That is, not that the calculation, um, you know, if you have a thousand processors, say, we finish the electronic structure part a thousand times faster um, by, by doing this twist averaging. And that means that you know, we, we can move the protons like every second or something like that. Um, so you know, this is uh, an advantage of Monte Carlo. That is, you can add extra averaging for basically for free. We use three different codes in this calculation. Bopink is the, our research developed code, MPI code, that we used over the last 10 years to develop a method. Quantum Expresso is a DFT code from Italy that we use to generate the orbitals for the trial wave function. And so we have to actually split off a process that does quantum espresso and then come back. And we can actually do that on other processors uh, while we are solving the electronic structure part. And then QMC pack is actually what we're converting to. This is actually one of the Blue Waters uh, benchmark codes. It was developed by somebody in my group, Chan and Kim, that was actually working at NCSA for a while, and now she's moved on to Intel. But it's actually an MPI, OpenMP, CUDA code, uses all the capabilities of Blue Waters, but it doesn't have all the capabilities for our coupled electron I in Monte Carlo, so we haven't quite got the conversion uh, going yet, but we will s shortly. Um, we, so I, I described we do a bunch of different levels of parallelization so we can do, um, you can use a, a large portion of the machine, you know, if we have that available. Um, so the liquid, I'm going to talk about physics here a little bit. This is a phase transition here. I mean, like you're going up with a molecular liquid and then you have an atomic liquid here. It doesn't have to be there. This line could shrink to nothing. It doesn't have to be there. Why should it? it make this, put in this phase transition. Well, you could say that about the ordinary liquid to gas transition. Why does that have to be there? Well, that's a long story in statistical mechanics, why you have first order transitions with a critical point. But it was actually predicted by two very famous physicists, Landau and Zeldovich, 1943. You can imagine they were busy uh, in that period in Moscow. Um, but they predicted this would happen with mercury, and since then it's had a long history and up and down. I mean, basically, theory could not decide if this transition was actually present. And in 2010, my graduate student, Miguel Morales, actually saw the transition. Um, and this is this little flat place here. That, uh, as you're going up in density at this, you know, 1,000 degrees, you see this transition. But, you know, we almost missed it, actually. This is the quantum Monte Carlo point. You see, we just didn't have enough computer time to to, uh, to resolve this very small transition. Sorry? This is hydrogen. I'm sorry, that was just Landau and Zodovich talked about mercury. Um, in the last, oh, so we made this prediction that encourages the experimentalists to look for it. And this is the uh, one experiment at Harvard and Silveris group uh, where they did diamond anvil cell uh, you know, they, I, I said that diamond anvils melt when you get up to 1,000 degrees or they break. Uh, but basically, they do laser heating, and so they just uh, pump some energy into it for a microsecond and then cool down, and they saw the transition. Um, also, in um, Sandia, they have this uh, uh, magnetic shock. It's called a Z-pinch, uh, and they saw the transition, too. Now. I'm going to compare those two experiments in a second, but first I want you to see where theory is sitting. You can get anything out of theory. Well, we know that, <laughs> right? These are various DFT calculations and various quantum Monte Carlo calculations and HSC and so forth. You can get lots of curves. Actually, none of the curves really agree with the Sandia experiment. Now, 
here's our results. These are obtained on Blue Water, just recently published. Um, first of all, the experimental results, this is the Diamond Anvil cell at Harvard, and this is the Sandia experiment. What's remarkable, they're different by a factor of two. two I mean, we're supposed to, as theoreticians, believe the experimentalists, we want to calibrate our methods with the experiment, but we, we can't do that because there's an experiment here, there's an experiment here. These are our results right in the middle. We feel fairly comfortable there. I should say, why do we have two results? Well, there's two isotopes of hydrogen, hydrogen and deuterium, and these are deuterium experiments and these are hydrogen experiments. We've heard that there's a third experiment. They're not releasing their results yet, but they're much closer to our predictions. Okay, five minutes, good. I'm just finished now. So anyway, so uh, you know, Blue Waters has enabled us to actually control our approximations a lot better. Uh, to uh, uh, get error bars on a lot of different things and to you know, look at two different isotopes and so forth. Um, and it's a very active field. Um, I just talked about this liquid-liquid transition, but we're actually doing a lot of other stuff like looking, trying to predict what, what these solid phases are like down here, whether you could have a superconducting, uh, a high temperature superconductor, really high temperature, like 1,000 degrees uh, Kelvin. Of course, it would be at Three, mega, three million atmospheres, but still it would be a high temperature superconductor. Anyway, those are kind of sorts of things we're doing. Uh, yeah, I guess I was going to talk about this, that um, this tell you a little bit about the transition. I mean, here, uh, this is just the, uh, the pressure jump at the transition. Uh, here is the conductivity showing it goes from uh, an insulating phase to a metallic phase. Uh, here is the, uh, the molecular bond that's showing that at the transition it goes from molecular phase to an atomic phase. Um, and so all the transitions happen, and you know, we have fairly small error bars of when it happens. So anyway, um, there is a very rich, subtle phase diagram of hydrogen. You know, I'm going to a Gordon conference next week, all about, uh, not next week, next month, talking all about this. Experiments are, are addressing the question, but they need uh, theoretical guidance to, uh, to decide which experimental techniques are reliable or not. Uh, there's a lots of different interesting physics, um, but the other message is that we're able to actually finally uh, do uh, calculations on uh, uh, using these quantum Monte Carlo techniques. Um, I didn't emphasize this, but the difference is uh, we're doing liquids with quantum Monte Carlo techniques. Previous quantum Monte Carlo techniques um, have just worked with a static crystal structure, like first we started with silicon, then we do uh, uh, you know, aluminum or whatever with a perfect lattice. Here, uh, the hydrogen atoms are moving around, you have dynamics, you have quantum effects of the protons and so forth. And that's really what Blue Waters has enabled us to do, is to do extend the scope of the methods to much, you know, much uh, richer uh, uh, systems. And it's been a combination of the computer power and the algorithmic pro progress, which, you know, there's a lot of details that I didn't discuss. One of the efforts that we're doing is using Quantum Monte Carlo to tailor force fields to a given problem, like for dense hydrogen, you would like to do molecular dynamics or classical molecular dynamics, uh, but because the DFT calculations are all over the place. We really need Quantum Monte Carlo uh, to um, inform us of what the right force fields are. And then if you did that, then you could do much larger systems. We could compute things like viscosities and thermal transport, which is important in modeling those planets. Uh, anyway, our goal is not to stick with hydrogen and helium, but to do more accurate simulations of all sorts of materials with these uh, methods. So we'll stop there. Thank you.